Hi, Bruno Jr. here. Our podcast, Busting Addiction and Smiths, is sponsored by SafeHouseRehab.com. SafeHouse believes that traditional treatments fall short of the needs of clients who face the modern problems of addiction. Modern problems need modern solutions. Multiple addictions, multiple relapses, multiple triggers, and cheaper and more powerful street drugs set up unprecedented challenges facing treatment centers. What is needed is a more sophisticated approach, a better way forward. There are three reasons to choose our progressive modern treatment program. One, a more sophisticated intake process. Two, technology proven to enhance recovery. And three, the most robust aftercare program in our sector. To learn more, visit us at safehouserehab.com. So this is season 13, episode 4, and I call this episode, I Lived a Horrible Life, part 2, because you heard part 1 a couple of episodes ago, and I thought I would continue my story. So I talked about how my life had entered a new phase from the time I entered treatment until I finally started to get back on my feet and begin a completely new way of thinking and being. After a couple of decades of heavy drinking and marijuana use, along with a few other drugs such as cocaine and meth, neither of which did the job that alcohol and marijuana did, not for me, I was warned by my company that maybe I had a problem. (laughs) And it was high time, pun intended, that I address this issue. That's what the corporate world called a problem, an issue. So they sent me to see a psychiatrist through the auspices of the EAP, a government agency known as the Employee Assistance Program, which, looking back, did a very nice job of connecting me to the psychiatrist who ultimately did help me get the help I needed, but not right away. So this referral was a year before I got fired, but I did not know that that was in my future at the time. I knew maybe I was overdoing the alcohol and dope, but I didn't didn't know that They were running my life or ruining it, actually. I didn't stop drinking or smoking dope, but I would visit the kind lady shrink every Friday for about nine months. And every Friday, I brought her a new symptom of insanity, anxiety disorder one week, depression every week, because I was always depressed, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder another week, rage, panic attacks, sexual obsession with my married girlfriend, fear times three, of fear of being fired, of being found out that I was an imposter on the job. So after hearing me whine every Friday for a few months, she prescribed an antidepressant that she thought might loosen my OCD. So I took it a few days later and came back to see her the following Friday. She says to me, so how is the new med going, Bruno, when I got there? And I said, I think my head's going to explode. It's making things totally worse than ever, and i got to stop taking it. And she says, you're not drinking while you're taking this med, are you? She's, like, asking kind of tentatively. Of course I'm drinking, I answered (laughs) rather forcefully. Like, well, obviously, isn't everybody, you know, one of those uh, thoughts and ideas? I saw, when I said that, I saw her eyes get real wide when I realized I'd never really told the truth of what I was doing every night and all weekend long. Every night, all night, and every weekend, all weekend long. So this was my routine. During the work week, as soon as it was 5 p.m. sharp and not a minute later, I would walk across an intersection near my office and have two vodka doubles, go to the garage and get my truck to drive a few minutes uh, north to my apartment, And on the way there, have two more vodka doubles, go next door to the liquor store and buy an extra vodka bottle if I needed some. And I bought some very good vodka. And for sure, buy a bottle of cheap but very nice Chilean wine and go home a few minutes away and get my evening lit up. The evening usually went like this. Make dinner while I drink and finish the whole full bottle of wine. If I need a nip of vodka, it's in the freezer. I usually like the higher class vodka, like Absolute Citron. And I might not always take a few hits off the marijuana, which was always around. It started not working for me a few months after I threw in, before I threw in the towel. You know, all the booze and all the drugs, they just stopped working. After my company tolerated my lack of contribution, my indecisiveness, my self-centeredness, and fearful catatonic behavior, they decided they were better off without me. This is what it was like. My brain was so frozen in fear that I could not compose one memo, now known as a longer email, about a topic in a full eight hours of supposed work. 
after, after a typical night of doing my thing, I woke up after maybe six hours of sleep, hung over from pot and booze and put on the suit and tie and all that, and drove downtown to the office perhaps 20 minutes away. My colleagues noticed that I would sweat profusely during meetings and presentations. One day the clients came in and said they want a private audience with the president of our company. Two days later, the CFO and CEO came to my office and they fired me. Oh, one week later, I checked myself into the Milwaukee Psychiatric Hospital. The kind doctor there, who himself was five years sober, which I thought was just totally impossible, said, I do believe, you believe, you want help. I told him I really didn't know what was wrong with me, but he assured me that we would get to the bottom of things. I kind of vaguely thought I was drinking too much, and that was about it. The staff watched me like a hawk for the first week because I learned later alcohol is the most dangerous drug from which to withdraw, as it can lead to delirium tremens, or what I fondly refer to as the heebie-jeebies, shakes and tremors and seizures that can actually kill you. I thought I was condemned to a life of paranoia and failure. I had no governor. I followed every whim, ran away when frightened by new situations, obsessed over everything. I was sleeping with the wife of a friend and could not get over her at all. She hinted that maybe I was nuts, and I took huge offense at that. I was spiritually bankrupt, violated every value I once held dear. But I was given the gift of desperation. I was ready to do anything to get and stay sane. I'm so grateful to Margaret, my counselor all those years ago, who was an iron hand and a velvet glove. I am not a slow learner, but I sure am a quick forgetter. Margaret took me by the hand and taught me to care for myself and to make the necessary sacrifices to do so. I was in intensive outpatient therapy, IOP, for 18 months. That's how much help I needed. That's how much my insurance also paid, which wasn't bad. That's how much help I needed, though, for my disorder, which included, among other things, beyond the medical uh, description, or the clinical descriptions, they included dishonesty, Codependency, fear, defiance, sexual obsession. I let go of my girlfriend a few weeks into treatment. Rigid opinions and more. She helped me understand, and self-centered, of course, was at the core of it. She helped me understand that the whole process was about rebuilding character and attaining a spiritual approach to living life. Only in the first of the 12 steps of the AA program is alcohol mentioned. The rest of the steps are all about holding ourselves accountable and still loving ourselves and also being selfless, altruistic, kind, and honest. Now, if that is not a transformation, what else could it possibly be? So what do we learn today? Number one, no matter how high end up we am flying, alcohol and drugs will bring us down so hard we won't even know what hit us. Two, denial is hardwired into our psyches. Recall, I did not tell my shrink that I was drinking even though I saw her every week for nine months. Three, it really wasn't until I got fired that I had to admit I was not sane. The job and its stature were the only things left that said I was still okay. Number four, I got the message the hard way, and today I call that the gift of desperation. And number five, in my opinion, only in the, well, in reality, only in the first step of the 12 steps of AA is alcohol mentioned. The rest is all about accountability. Our podcast is sponsored by SafeHouseRehab.com, a modern approach to recovery. To learn more, visit us at SafeHouseRehab.com.